We've looked at the idea of disaster planning, why we do it, and how we do it. Now let's look at the specific elements that go into a good disaster plan. We start by doing a risk assessment, identifying the vulnerabilities, and then identifying sources of assistance. Set priorities as to what's most important to protect. Develop an emergency organization chart, and then train your organization in the implementation of the plan. Now that's the big picture. So let's start by looking at risk assessment. Gregor Trinkus Randall specializes in risk assessment and has worked with many libraries, museums, and historic properties. When we look at the outside of a building, we need to look at a variety of things to see what could potentially create problems both with the structure and with what the, is inside. Uh, in this particular instance, we're looking at a number of things that have created problems or could potentially create problems, as well as a few things that have been done to rectify situations. For example, the downspout that is here is rusted, and therefore there are a couple of uh, holes in it. It also goes into a potential dry well but we're not sure exactly whether or not it is a dry well and so that this would need to be checked in order to find out whether that actually is the case or not. The roofs on this house are multiple and they have multiple different angles. This means that there's a potential for ice jams, ponding of water, the collection of snow, uh, all of which could then result in extra pressure on the roof and the possibility of uh, roof leaks. One good thing that's been done at the roof level is the installation of wires along the edge by the gutter and in the gutter to eliminate or at least dramatically reduce the possibility of ice jams. At the ground level, what we're also looking at is a window well that is not covered and could create a pond, as it were, that could eventually end up with the water coming in through the window and into the basement. In addition, there is some rotted wood, and along the slab that's on the outside of the building, there is mold and also uh, moss growing. Uh, this slab also potentially presents a problem. Uh, initially, when many of these buildings were built with a cement slab around the outside, it was aimed and slanted slightly away from the building. This meant that for houses that did not have a gutter, what would happen is that the water would then be directed away from the building. Unfortunately, what often happens is as the building settles, that slab ends up going level or slightly in towards the house. And so what ends up happening is that the water would then go to the foundation and potentially into the foundation. Another area that has the possibility of a leak from the outside is where the base of the window, the bottom of the window, is actually almost at the level of roof. And so particularly where there could be snow build up there as the snow melts and you have water leakage into the house, either inside the wall itself or all the way on the inside of the wall. One area that is often neglected is the proximity of large trees, particularly on the west side of the building where the prevailing winds are. The problem there is that a strong wind could potentially blow the tree down onto the house. Uh, there have been instances where after a significant amount of rain, uh, trees that were solid as could be within the ground, uh, with a minor wind, uh, not even a hurricane, but a tropical, tropical storm type wind, have blown over and landed on buildings. We have a large hill that goes up immediately behind the building, and the wall is right at the building within six feet or so of it, so that there is a real problem and the potential for water runoff and snow runoff coming down over the wall and into the house. We need to consider the possibility of not only snow slides, but also of earth slides and mud slides, depending on the location within the country. One of the things that you need to think about when we're looking at buildings in an area like this where we've got a lot of woods is the fact that we've got here about a 30-foot um, fire break. This is sort of the minimum that would, you would need uh, because of the fact that if there's a wildfire at all, we've got a pro problem of the flames jumping. 
This area is also particularly uh, bad because it's got a lot of undergrowth. And when you have this much in undergrowth, there's a real problem for fire. The other problem that we have with the brush is that we are potentially dealing with uh, wildlife, rabbits, uh, rats, mice, and others that enjoy uh, the cultural resources as food. And so as a result, we want to keep them out of the uh, cultural area. And so when we examine the building, one of the number of things that we see that are a problem in relation to this particular uh, instance, um, one of which is we have a loose downspout, which is connected to the gutter. The gutter is, has a possibility of getting clogged and therefore having an overrun back to the, um, to the roof. And then in the winter, particularly, you've got a problem of ice jams. But in the, in the summer, uh, there's a problem with the water running down the walls on the inside and affecting collections. But often what we'll see is downspouts that are not connected to the uh, gutter or that come down and end up actually uh, taking the water directly to the basement. We also have a door here that is actually below grade. Water is going to be uh, directed towards that door and then going into the building. Uh, the door also has a broken window, uh, which lets in air and it also lets in the uh, moisture and rain. We're also seeing that there are other broken windows. In this particular case, we have a towel that is filling up one of the holes. Uh, and interestingly enough, right here between the two windows, there's a wasp nest, uh, which then shows that there's infiltration by the insects. Problems with vines is that they tend to, because of the tendrils, go in and find any particular cracks that may exist in concrete or in uh, field stone. And as a result, they work their way in. This tends to open this up significantly. And eventually, over time, what we end up with is a, um, and cracks that allow water to come in. Uh, the roof needs to be examined on a regular basis to make sure that we don't have loose shingles or tiles. Uh, one of the problems with a roof leak is the fact that nobody knows exactly where it's coming from. It could be coming from the opposite side of the, built of the roof and then working its way down in one area that then will uh, affect the collections on the inside. Uh, another problem with roofs is the fact that we often have skylights. Uh, skylights very frequently leak. Often when buildings are built, the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning system, or HVAC system, is often put on the roof. And this has resulted in numerous occasions of significant leaks uh, to th that go into the building. Uh, pipes have broken, pipes have frozen, uh, our construction people have forgotten to put antifreeze into the, uh, the air conditioning system, and then as a result there have been uh, freeze-ups and significant amount of damage. So it's the best place to put a, uh, an HVAC system is outside on the grounds so that uh, it's away from the building and not on the roof. Now that we've looked at the outside of the building for potential problems, let's look at the inside of the building and see if there are any problems that can um, be identified and therefore rectified on the inside. Uh, in this particular instance, we've got uh, shelving that is much too close to the floor. The general recommendation is that the bottom shelf be uh, six inches off the floor so that if there is a water problem, that the collections do not get affected. On the other hand, this set of shelving is bolted to the wall, so there is a lot of stability. And, and if there were the possibility of an earthquake, uh, there's a much greater chance that these materials are going to stay on the shelf. In looking at the walls uh, in this particular area, we have a lot of good insulation, which means that there's going to be a greater chance to keep the temperature and the humidity relatively constant. Uh, and actually speaking of keeping it constant, in this instance we have two monitoring devices. Uh, one is a, is a data logger, an ACR data logger that uh, is taking uh, readings uh, at a frequent rate and then can be downloaded into a computer to put onto graphs and see what's happening there. Uh, and we have a thermal hygrometer which allows us to look specifically at the temperature and the relative humidity. You need to also look at windows on the inside seeing whether or not there are any stains, uh, any open windows, any cracks, any problems such as was mentioned outside in relation to the uh, glazing of the windows. The 
Walls need to be checked to see if there are any areas where there's peeling paint or if there are water stains, as we've also seen on the tiles and the ceiling. The tiles uh, in this particular instance where we have uh, drop ceiling have some stains on them, which means there has been a water problem at one point in the past. If there are pipes above the drop ceilings and we're in cold weather area, uh, that is where a lot of times pipes will freeze. In this case, the pipes that are there are sprinkler pipes and the area is insulated, but it is an area that needs to be addressed and checked. One way that this can be done is to open up in really cold weather some of the ceiling tiles and allow the warm air, warmer air that is uh, in the room itself to circulate up where the pipes are. The boxes on the shelves are good. If there is a water problem potentially, then the boxes are going to keep the collections dry at least for a period of time. Uh, this set of shelving also has a top shelf, which is good because what it does is protects the top shelf of materials from the uh, water that may be coming from above. One of the other things that we see in this location are sheets that are protecting the materials on the shelves from dust and uh, other uh, airborne pollutants. However, the sheets do not protect the collections if there's a problem with water. Uh, so that it's a good idea to have some plastic, either sheeting that's either over the shelving and the, the cotton, or in a position where it can be brought down quickly in the event of some water problem. Other things to think about is the lighting. One of the worst sources of uh, ultraviolet radiation, which can then fade collections uh, significantly, uh, is fluorescent lighting. These tubes can be covered with a, an ultraviolet filtering sleeve, which will then cut down the ultraviolet radiation probably 95 to 98 percent. One thing that needs to be considered whenever looking at a structure or the collections uh, in a cultural institution is the fact that many small items, uh, fall, small incidences of damage, such as uh, an insect infestation, uh, silverfish, book lice, or carpenter ants, mold, leaks tend, if they're not addressed, to escalate and they sort of compound one another. So as a result, what you may think is not a very large problem may end up being a significant problem because of the uh, culmination of a variety of these things uh, all happening at once. Gregor showed what an expert sees doing risk assessment. When looking at your facility, remember to look carefully at the integrity of the structure. Even small cracks can lead to major water, rodent, or insect damage. Observe the surrounding area and recognize problems that can be caused by trees or the slope of the land. Be aware that small changes over time can accumulate and cause major problems.